Well, thank you for coming. We are going to look at Plato's Time Is, not the whole of it, of course. A couple of small parts of it. Let me move this for a moment. All right. Now, of all the works of Plato, it is said that the Time Is has had the greatest impact on medieval Europe all the way into the present world. I would like to just deal with two parts of it. One, what we can learn about the mind of the Demiurgos and the creative process and the problem of form and formless. How you can say form is empty and empty is form in a Platonic world. For well, that's the big problem in Buddhism. So I think it will be fun to put the two together this evening. How are we going to do it? Well, as the process of creation goes on, if we could get an insight into the mind of the Demiurgos, and the Demiurgos is the name of the God, the, the maker. If we could get an insight into the stages that the Demiurgos goes through in the states of mind, and the processes, his own mind, as he does the creative process, we can collect them together and come out with a theology. So our goal is to get a theology of the Demiurgos. Theology is a study of God. And so what we're going to get is, as it were, the unfoldment of the state of mind of the Demiurgos in the process of creation. State of mind of the, of the Demiurgos as he proceeds through the creative process in bringing into existence what he calls the becoming and the all. That's what we're after. Because he has two goals talk about becoming and the all, what we call the universe. Well, this is going to be very easy for us to do tonight, because I have the good fortune to have some great works available that have been translated, made available. Now, everything I'm using comes from the Loeb, edition of Plato, the Bury, Bury B-U-R-Y, translation. It's a very nice one. Thomas Taylor has another. There are other translations. And uh, if we then focus at the unfoldment of the creative process so we can see the mind of the Demiurgos as he proceeds, we can work together and get the whole personality, the persona of the Demiurgos. Or an insight, therefore, into the mind of God in the creative process. Therefore, wouldn't you agree it ought to be a simple task if we get good quotes? <laughs> All right. Watch what we're going to do now. Let this be the beginning. Let us say this is the actual steps that bring about the becoming, the generation of the universe, our cosmos. As we watch this process unfold, there's going to be a parallel a parallel process where Plato describes the state of mind of the Demiurgos. Now we're going to come up with a rather curious idea. In the work, it talks about time, you see, in a very important way. The first part of the unfoldment is eternal. The second part is in time. So in order to make the whole cosmos and the universe as much as possible like the Creator, it's necessary that time comes into being, comes into becoming. And therefore he has a most beautiful idea of time. He has time. Time is the moving image of eternity. So it's a moving image, right? It's a moving image. Time is a moving image of eternity. 
And of course, in the Greek, the eternity is that which always is. And if we could keep that idea in place every time we use the word eternity, it will save us a great deal of difficulty. What is eternity? That which always is. It's a simultaneous whole. What always is is a simultaneous whole. Therefore, in order to bring about a knowledge of the nature of the creative process and the demiurgos state of mind, we're going to reverse the process and then treat it as a simultaneous whole. Well, what does that mean? Well, good. Uh, good thing we have another page. All right. Essentially, this here, of course, is the demiorgos. And in the process, the demiorgos, the demiorgos looks in the process of creating to himself because the, the most significant principle in the whole unfoldment of creation is a term that we've become used to, likeness. Let's see how he describes it. It's very beautiful because likeness is the supreme originating principle of the cosmos. Let us now state the cause whereof he that constructed it constructed becoming and the all. He was good, and in him that is good no envy ariseth ever concerning anything. And being devoid of envy, he desired that all should be as far as possible like unto himself. This principle, then, we shall be wholly right in accepting from men of wisdom as being above all the supreme originating principle of becoming in the cosmos, likeness. First thing he did, therefore, to bring into existence is that he desired that all should be as much as possible like himself. Therefore, the first creative burst from the demiurgos, from the divine, is desire. So here we have desire. That starts it all. And C and C desired that all should be as much as possible like himself, and there was no envy on his part to block that, no jealousy. Therefore, he could allow creation to be as like himself as much as possible. Therefore, the first, the primary, and the supreme originating principle of the entire cosmos is likeness. Now, as I read, you can tell me all of the states of mind that are described in the process of creation. We're going to collect them, consider them as a simultaneous whole, and we'll talk about, therefore, the state of mind of God or the demiorgos in the process of creation. For God desired that as far as possible all things should be good and nothing evil. Desired, second desire. Wherefore, when he took over all that was visible, took over, right? Took over all that was visible. And the visible, of course, before order, it was without form. So God desired as far as possible that all things should be, used, be good and nothing evil. Whereupon, when he took over all that was visible, seeing that it was not in a state of rest, but in a state of discordant and disorderly motion, he brought it into order out of disorder. So what did he do? Look here. He took over. He saw, he made a judgment, right? he took over, he was seeing disorder, he brought it into order out of disorder, deeming, thinking, deeming that the former state isn't always better than the latter. So he brought it, 
He took over the visible, seeing the disorder, he brought it into order. So he is a ordering, right? He took it over, and what did he do? First, he desired it to become like himself as much as possible. Therefore, the first thing he did, he took over the visible, seeing that it was in disorder, and he brought it into order. So the first creative step, in principle, is bringing into order. Springs from the very desire that the universe should be as much as possible like unto himself. And he deemed that the former state in is always better than the latter, right? He deemed it, right? He judged it. He judged these two. He judged these two. And he said, this is always and always better than the other. Therefore, right away he makes a value judgment. This is better than that. And therefore, we can see another state, another judgment. He brought it in and judges the one better than the other. Therefore, see, desires took over the visible, seeing it was disorderly. He can see disorder. He brought it into order. He judged the one better than the other. For him who is most good, it neither was nor is, nor is permissible to perform any action save what is most fair. Our translation says fair, the word is beautiful. Therefore, not only did he bring it into order, but he brought it into an order that was beautiful. Therefore, beauty lies at the heart of the structure of this Platonic reality. For it's not per permissible to perform any action save what is most beautiful, because that is his nature. If he's going to act, he's going to act in such a way that every act and everything he does can be judged beautiful. Now, notice now, now comes the usia, now comes the reflection. All right, now he's going to do a reflection on this. All right, notice. As he reflected, therefore, he perceived that such creatures as are by nature visible, none that is irrational will be more beautiful comparing whole with holes than the rational. And further, that reason cannot possibly belong to any apart from soul. And so because of this reflection, he constructed reason within soul and soul within body, and he fashioned the all. That so the work he was executing might be of its nature most beautiful and most good. So as he reflected, see, now he's reflecting, now he's reflecting. And reflecting, he perceived, right, got an insight, he perceived. And reflecting, he perceived that if such creatures, as are by nature visible, none that is irrational will be more beautiful, comparing whole with holes than the rational. Therefore, the rational is beautiful, right? The rational is beautiful. He reflected, he reflected. Hey, this is a reflection. And he gained an insight, right? Ha! Ah, gained an insight, reflected. And he perceived, that's a rule, so he's perceived, that if creatures that are by nature visible, none of them, none that is ir irrational will be fairer or more beautiful, comparing whole with holes than the rational. But therefore, the rational, he gained an insight. The insight into the fact that the rational is more beautiful than the irrational, and since every act he performs must be beautiful, he is then going to act accordingly, beautiful acts that are rational. And further, that reason cannot possibly exist without a soul, nor a soul without a body. So because of this reflection, another reflection, say another reflection, right? He's got another reflection. Got another reflection. 
He constructed reason within soul and soul within body as he fashioned the all. So the work he was executing might be of its nature most beautiful and most good. Ah, see? Right? So that he was ex so the work he was executing might be as by its very nature most beautiful and good. Therefore, he's guided by beauty and good. And therefore, if it's going to be, see, we always work backwards. Therefore, if we want to look at the nature of the mind of God and the nature of God, then the nature of God must be both beautiful and rational. Ordered. Good. So then in fashioning the all, so this work might be executed in such a way, he desired, therefore, that the, the entire cosmos should come into existence as a living creature, and therefore the whole thing now the whole universe now is like a living creature. The whole thing, the whole universe now is a living creature. Soul, therefore, must be spread around through the whole. And if soul is in it, therefore reason is in it. And if reason is in it, it must be beautiful, for it's ordered. And if it's ordered in such a way, the very nature of it will be judged to be good. For if it is beautiful, it is ordered, and it is better than that which is disordered. So therefore, the entire thing now the whole universe now is ensouled. The whole thing is ensouled. The whole thing has reason spread throughout it, and it takes on a visible form. Now look here. See, now we're after this. Now we're after this. This is really rather important, isn't it? In this creation, in any creation, the particular model we're looking at is that of the artist, right, the craftsman. Right? If he is going to do something creative, therefore, he must have some model in his mind. Right? He must focus his mind on the model. He then must have a skill which guides his hand and so he can create the copy. And therefore, this idea in the creator's mind or the artist's mind is the model. Now we want to take a look at that. In this whole thing, since obviously from the beginning he desired that the universe should be as come as much as possible like unto himself, we now want to spend a little time on the model. This being established, we must declare that which comes next in order. In the semblance and the likeness, of which of the living creatures did the constructor of the cosmos construct it? Well, let me skip a bit. We shall affirm that the cosmos, more, more than aught else, resembles most closely that living creature of which all living creatures severally and, gener and generically are portions. For that living creature embraces and contains within itself all intelligible living creatures. Therefore, this model contains within it all intelligible living beings. Therefore, in the mind of God, the model that was used in the construction of the universe is this model, which is called the intelligible living being. Sometimes it's called the intelligible living creature. Now, when he makes the copy, as you move from a, a model to a copy, obviously there's always a loss. There's always a difference, a significant difference. Therefore, in the unfoldment of the universe, that can't come into existence, or you wouldn't have a model copy. This which comes into existence, then, is going to have all possible living creatures
among which is man, the, intel the one creature with mind. And therefore, it's going to stand in relationship to that as a model copy, it being the copy. Therefore, the entire cosmos, therefore, is being made and constructed in terms of this model. This is sometimes called the, uh, uh, the forms or uh, the mind of God or the idea in the mind of God or the form of all forms. In any case, we'll call it the forms, the archetypal forms. And that is an idea in the mind of God. For since God desired to make it resemble most closely that intelligible creature which is fairest, most beautiful of all, and in all ways most perfect, he constructed it as a living creature, one, visible, containing within itself all living creatures which are by nature akin to itself. Therefore the entire cosmos, you see, is a God. It's living as a body, as a soul, it has reason, it's beautiful, it's created in the model of something that is supremely good. Therefore, this is called, in some, and he, he talks about it in very various ways, but it's the living God. The cosmos is therefore a living God. Because once it's created, it goes on into creation without end, and therefore it has that aspect of being eternal. Now, he then goes on to talk about the fact that this must be this must be one. There can't possibly be two universes like it, for if it were two, then the two together would be one of two parts. Therefore, he says, however you reason it, this must be a one. If this is a one, therefore the demiorgos itself must be a one. Not the one, a one. Now, there's one principle, of course, that's very important for us that I'd like to get into, which is on the next page on 59. This one principle, which is the supreme originating principle of all creation, is likeness. Now, likeness, likeness is a term we've been using for quite a while. Now, just to make sure how it fits into analogy, all right? We're now going to just quickly review how analogy and likeness are intertwined. Take any four-term analogy or three, we'll take a four-term analogy. A is to B as C is to D. We can put it in terms of ideas. A shepherd is to his sheep as a ruler is to his subjects. All likenesses occur when you have different orders of things, different orders, these are two different orders, within which they are paired relationships. There must be a paired relationship, and that paired relationship must have similar relations, that must have similar relations. Not same, similar. As an example, a shepherd in working with his sheep functions in a certain way. That's how you get similar relations. A shepherd guides, cares, protects, 
and several other important things, but let's leave it at that for the moment. His sheep. A ruler guides, cares, and protects, ideally, his people. But it can't be in the same way. Otherwise, of course, we'll have rulers who get, you know, police dogs to herd their people, to herd his subjects up to the mountains to eat grass and things of that nature, right? So therefore, it's not the same way, it is similar. All right, relations are similar. Next up, any likeness therefore, is when you take alternate terms, alternate terms, and express the relationship with the word likeness. A shepherd is like a ruler. A ruler is like a shepherd. Alternate terms. Sheep are like subjects, and subjects can be said to be like sheep. Therefore, any time you have a, an analogy, taking alternate terms, so long as the terms are analogous, then taking the alternate terms, you can then substitute the word like for the word is to, and you have generated a simile. A simile is the very mark of functions within analogies, and we express it with the word like. All right, now, what is most interesting, of course, I don't know whether, maybe I can read, maybe I can just quickly take a moment out to show you something quite interesting. Take a three-term analogy. A is to B, as B is to C, three-term analogy, same principles hold, as we said a moment ago. A mean analogy can, is the most, of all analogies, the most beautiful. This is the transformation of an analogy, by the way. Ah, good heavens, what did I do here? Uh, you can transform a three-term analogy by switching the terms within which is what we did here, or between. Taking them between, therefore, and then switching them again, these are the only four possible valid forms of a mean analogy. Now, if I can direct you to some inherently beautiful, inherently beautiful features of a mean analogy, notice, That means it has double symmetry. You can fold it over twice, either way, and you reproduce the other side. Therefore, it has symmetry. It has balance because you can take the first two terms from the first place and transfer it to the second, or take the second and transfer it to the first. You can take the extreme terms and the extreme terms, A and C, and make them the mean terms, the middle terms. You can take a, B, B, C, A, B, B, C. You can take C, B, B, A, C, B, B, A. You can take B, B, A, B, A, C, B, which is the same as B, A, C, B. You can take B, C, A, B, the same thing as B, C, A, B. And therefore, you have in, inherently within a mean analogy a wide variety of aesthetic principles, symmetry, balance, order, transformation. Now let's go back into this curious one line which is so great in Plato now. Now, that which has come into existence must needs to be a bodily form, visible, tangible. Yet without fire, nothing could, could ever become visible nor tangible without some solidity nor solid without earth. Hence, in beginning to construct the body of the all, God was making it of fire and earth. But it's not possible for two things alone to be conjoined without a third. For, for there must needs be some intermediary bond to connect the two. 
and the most beautiful of bonds is that which most perfectly unites into one both itself and the things which it binds together. And to effect this in the, in the most beautiful manner is the natural property of analogy. Proportion and analogy are the same word. One's Latin, one's Greek. Now, we can now look at that diagram and read the section and you will see that the words in this paragraph can easily be represented in the diagram we have there. For whenever the middle term of any three num numbers, whether you're talking about cubic or square, is such that the first term is to it, such as the first term is to it, we're on the first line, we can go right through this and you can see that this is a, a way of representing what he is saying, is the first term is to it. Whenever the middle term of any three numbers cubic or square was such that the first term is to it, so is it to the last term, so is it to the last term, B is to C. And again, conversely, as the last term is to the middle, as the last term is to the middle, right, so is the middle to the first, so is the middle to the first, going both ways. Then the middle term becomes, in turn, the first and the last, while the last Right? While well, the first and last become its middle terms. That's exactly what we did. First and the last become its middle terms. Therefore, the constructor of the universe uses the most beautiful mathematical expression, the mean analogy, in the construction of the universe. Now here's where we have a problem. See, these are three terms. He also says it can be for four terms. The four terms, of course, are going to come out to be the four elements. Now, if there is anything that is peculiar about the idea of the four elements, is that the four elements do not mean the four elements. The way we understand the ancients is totally wrong. The four elements are not elements. And that's going to cause us a nice deal of fun. In order to do that first, let's see now whether we can pause before I go into this section, which is the section on analogies, the four elements, and bring it together with the form and the formless. Let's see now if we can then quickly grasp what we were doing before and bring it together, right? What is it then that the Demiurgos did in bringing this creation into existence? Going backwards, he used the most beautiful the most beautiful of analogies. And built in within the whole idea of analogy must be the property of likeness. Since the goal is to make the universe as much as possible like unto himself, since there is no envy at all possible in the Demiurgos, we can now go back and say, what is it that the Demiurgos does when he brings into existence the cosmos and the all? He judges it. He makes value judgments, better, worse. He's guided by beauty, good. All right. He brings things into order. He judges the order as more beautiful and more and better, of course, than disorder. He sees that. He has, therefore, an insight, what the work called perceives. He reflects. Right? He goes through reflections. He turns about and makes reflections upon the whole at least twice. And it starts with an elemental desire that all should be as much as possible like unto himself. Now, this, of course, is taking things in a sequence, isn't it? It's taking it in terms of a sequence. See, that's what we were talking about a moment ago. See, time is in sequence, isn't it? Present, past, future. Well, time is a moving image of eternity. Now, what does that mean? That means we can break up the creative process and talk about it in stages. 
but obviously it takes place as a simultaneous whole. Therefore, the mind of the creator, all of this takes place as a simultaneous whole, and that's the very idea of eternity. Because when everything is seen as a simultaneous whole, that which always is, and that which always is then is an insight into the mind of the creator, or the most fundamental idea of God, then that is the model for all creation and existence. Therefore, you see, as this goes on, if you want to become like this demiurgos, then you too now are going to have to do what? You're going to have to desire that you yourself become as beautiful and, and good as possible, and therefore there's no alternative with that desire, is that you must then reflect and bring everything into order, not disorder. You must then uh, see the processes that bring it into order, you must guide it. You must judge the one to be better than the other. You must recognize that beauty is one of the guiding principles of creation because that not only is beautiful, but it's also good. And as you do that and bring it about through analogies, through the creative possible process of using these analogies, you are in fact becoming like the demiurgos, like the divine. That's what Plato is doing. Now, with this in the background, I'd like to now go into the next part which is, what, what is this nature of reality to Plato? What is this? All right, look around. One thing we're sure of, <laughs> it's all forms, isn't it? All right, everything you see has a form, and we've been told that it has elements. Well, let's take a look at this rather curious thing. These are sometimes called elements. But in Plato, they are not. Elements usually means they're primordial, they're basic, they're intrinsic. And therefore, we laugh at the Greek view because anyone who holds that the basic elements of creation are these things, since we have the atomic hypothesis, we tend to laugh at them. But they don't have that anyhow, so maybe we should hold back on our laugh and see what he's really saying. All of these brings, bring into an existence form. This chalk has a form, right? Everything has a form. It also, what gave it its form, whatever form it has, is itself in a process. It gained it. It sustains it, it's going to lose it. Now, for Plato, these are in actuality moments in time. That's all there are. They really are and should be represented in this way. All of the elements have a source. Whatever any one of these four is, it's only that for a brief, for only a certain period of time, and it transforms itself into the others. Therefore, it's not elemental. They're merely motions. They're processes which at certain points take on particular forms. He says, that these so-called elements transform by being compressed, by some, some condensation, some compression. It dissolves, it contracts. So it has these forms, you see. It compresses, right? it condenses, it dissolves, Right. These are the forces, right? It combusts. And most of, right? these are the four. One, two, three, four. 
These are processors. Therefore, he says, what you really should avoid is speaking of these elements as if they were states. You should only talk about them, and he uses this term, they are really such like. That's the language again, like. So if you say something is burning, fire, no, no, no. It's going through a process of combustion. It's being transformed. Right? Through that very process, it's then going to become uh, aerated. Right? It's going to condense. It's going to come down. The processes are then are going to be brought together. It's then going to scatter. These are the, these are the real processes. And therefore, the question is, what is the substance that goes through these changes? What is the substance which sometimes we, are, we call matter, which he doesn't call matter? What is that substance? Well, I am on 109, 10, 11, all of those pages. You'll see that these pages are odd numbered because the even numbers are all classic Greek and I didn't copy that because I think you, you might take too much time reading the classic Greek if I gave it to you. Is that nice? I'm on page 113 for a moment. We must, however, in beginning our fresh account of the universe, make more distinctions than we did before. For as be <laughs> then we distinguish two forms. We must now declare another third kind. For our former exposition, eh, those two were sufficient. One of them being the model, intelligible, uniform, existent, and the second, the copy, the model's copy subject to becoming invisible. Those are the two forms, the model and the copy. Now we have to add a third. And he says, you know what, it, this, is, this third form is baffling and obscure, very baffling and obscure. He said, this third one in particular, it should be the receptacle, it should be a receptacle, the nurse of all becoming. Yes, but we have to describe this with a little more care. So now he talks about the processes of becoming. First of all, we see that what we call water is becoming by condensation, as we believe stones and earth. And again, the same substance by dissolving and dilating becomes breath and air. And air through combustion becomes fire. And conversely, fire, when contracted and, qu and quenched, uh, returning back to the form of air, and the air once more uniting and condensing into cloud and mist, and issuing from these, when still further compressed, flowing water. And from water, earth, and stones again. Thus we see the elements passing on to one another in an unbroken circle, what he calls the gift of birth. That's all this is going on and on and on. Okay. Going on and on and on. At times it appears like this, at times like this. But actually it's nothing other than the gift of birth. All creation is unfolding. It's birthing. The entire universe is birthing. It's, got, it's a continual process of creation. Since none of these ever remains identical in appearance, which of them shall a man definitely affirm to be any one particular element, and no other without incurring ri ridicule? Safest plan by treating of these elements is to proceed in this way, he says. 
Whatsoever object we perceive to be constantly changing from one state to another, like fire, that object, be it like fire, we must never describe as this, but such like. Nor should we ever call water this, but such like. Nor should we describe any other element, blah, 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 other than such like. Because it's only one substance going through these transformations. Now, we're now going to a rather interesting point. But that wherein they are always in appearance, becoming severally into existence, see, wherein, two words, wherein and where from. But that wherein they are always in appearance, coming severally into existence, and wherefrom, in turn, they perish, right? So, in and from. Wherein and where from. So, as it, see, as it emerges in some form and returns, perishes, as it is in one term and returns, as it is in one, etc., in and from is all it is. It returns to its source. It emerges from its source continuously, continuously going on and on and on in an ordered movement. In describing that and that alone, should we employ the terms this and that? Whereas in describing what is such like, hot for instance, or white, or any such opposite qualities. Now, here is the most interesting feature. All right. Look here. <clears throat> what is this that takes on all of these forms? He never describes it, but he likens it to gold. He says, it is as if you're talking about gold. You can then take it through these transformations. And just because it takes on a particular form of chalk, you don't say it's chalk, you say it's such like. But in essence, what it really is, is formless. It is formless. Pure. It is formless, pure, so pure, it has no marks of itself. Therefore, you see, these forms that are impressed upon it take on the form. It doesn't have any. There can it take on what itself doesn't have. I'm on 119. Therefore, we must conceive of three kinds. And this becomes the father, the mother, and the child, or the offspring. The becoming is that wherein it becomes. Wherein it becomes. Ah, that's the, that's the leaf. When in, in which it becomes. The source wherefrom and the becoming is copied and produced. Therefore you have the recipient, the mother, the source, the father, and what's engendered between these two, the offspring. Therefore he has nothing other than the transformation of these so-called elements within three ideas. Right? The source, say the source, that's the father. That's the father where it receives these forms, the mother. What's produced, the child or the offspring. 
Therefore, all of nature is nothing other than these three things he sees continually taking place, going through these changes that we wrote there on the side of the board. And what is it? It's something that he describes only with the image gold. That's what he likens it to, I should say. Look at the way he describes it. I'm on 119, and also to perceive that if, stamp, if the stamped copy is to assume diverse appearances of all sorts, that substance wherein it is set and stamped could not possibly be suited to its purpose unless it were itself devoid of all those forms which, is about, which it is about to receive from any quarter. For where it's similar to any of the entering forms or receiving forms of an opposite or a, a wholly different kind, as they arrived, it would copy them badly. So likewise, it is right that the substance which is to be fitted to receive frequently over its whole extent the copies of all things intelligible and eternal should itself, of its own nature, be void of all the forms. Therefore, this is Plato's voidness. This is the void. I, this is the void. It itself is void of all forms. It can take on all. Therefore, by the way, would you not agree? Form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Form is nothing other than emptiness. Emptiness is nothing different than form. Therefore, the three major ideas in this process of the transition, going back and forth continuously, are the offspring, the mother, and the father. Now, I use this language from another translation because this is uh, Thomas Taylor's translation, and it's a, it has it a little richer than the Bury translation. So, let's just take a look at that for a moment, and let me push on. Use my book now. So let's put it back. In the mind of the Creator, Mind of the demiurgos, right? in order for the universe to be constructed such as it is, right? the demiurgos must look to himself, that reflective capacity, and that's called the intelligible living creature. And on the basis of that, which is an idea in the mind of God, that's the model for the creation of the universe. And therefore, through all of these transformations, through all of the transformations, all the living creatures and all things come into existence through this transforming process. It's the gift of birth. 
And uh, in this creative universe that is developed, there's one curious kind of thing in here, which is man. And for Plato, that's the creature then that can become aware. And he says, you become aware of these things by studying, by studying. the copy, you can infer properties of the model. You may not be able to get directly, a direct perception obviously, into the mind of God, but by studying the processes and trying to understand them with the highest sense of reason, looking therefore to the highest principles, you should then be able to establish the ordered process in nature and work backwards to get to the model. That model is the intelligible living creature. And now there's one more step all set. The relationship between the demiurgos and the idea in the mind of God must itself be a likeness. And that's the next likeness. Let's see if we can do it again, all right? The artist who paints, sculpts, must have an idea in his mind. That idea through and with his skill, he can then construct what he constructs. This idea is an idea in the mind of this creator. This is an idea. How do you now go from, how can you then study the artist's mind if all you know about the artist's is the idea in the mind of the artist that he used when he created whatever he did? Work backwards. If you know nothing, nothing at all about an artist's, especially, you know, those great cave paintings, what can you infer about the state of mind of the artist? You know, if we didn't know anything about Michelangelo personally, historically, what could we infer about that man just by looking at the works? That's the process. That's the highest process now. Because this is where Plato is going. He wants to bring you into this, to move you here, would you not agree then, now the same, the processes that are going on here, in the intelligible living creature there must equally be, all right, this has to be eternal, unchanging, for any model that is changing in the process of becoming a model to be copied would make chaos out of the, out of the copy itself. Therefore, this must be eternally unchanging. Therefore, the idea in the mind of the demiorgos must be eternal, must be unchanging. Now, what can we infer about the demiorgos? Always is, unchanging, intelligible. Now, this step, this step, all we're doing is reversing the processes that we did here. You're going to reverse the processes. That's all you're going to do. Would you not agree? Now let's see if we can use what we have. Go back to the first page and let's do it together. All right. I'm on page 55. Why did he desire the universe to come into existence? 
So to be like it? Okay. He wanted it to be like himself. All right, that's true. Therefore, there should be some likeness between these two. We can work back and say, therefore, if we can understand why he generated it, we might be able to assign those qualities to him or it. What was the reason creation came into being? Page 55. Give me a quote. Why did he desire what he desired? That is, for creation to come into being? To become it? What's the reason, the source? Why? Why? Because? He wanted order. That's right. Also? He wanted order because he judged that to be better than disorder. All right? Mm -hmm. So he can judge that something is better than, than right? Better than disorder? Right? Most beautiful. Ah, uh, beauty? Beauty guides him? Mm -hmm. Let's go back over it. Pardon? Okay, that's negative. All right. What can you, since there is no envy in him, what can we say about him? All good. He is all good. Good. Ah. He's reflective. Ah, look here. Then we can now say we can look at the motives for doing what he's doing. We can say he is all good. Good. More? Uh, whatever he does, he does beautifully, or in this translation, the fairest. Same word, beauty, fairest. All right. So all his acts are beautiful. If all his acts are beautiful, all right, all that he does is good, his nature must be what? Providential. Ah, okay, let me help you. Just, we just read it together. Let us now state the cause, wherefore he that constructed it, constructed becoming in the all. He was good. And in him that is good, no envious arises ever concerning anything. And being devoid of any envy, he desired that all should be as far as possible like unto himself. Right, this is the supreme originating principle of becoming in the cosmos. So what can we say? The basic reason he did it is because he is good. And since he's good, he desired that all should be like himself as much as possible. Therefore, the demiorgos must be good. And since he desires order, he's bringing the whole thing into order. Therefore, come on. See, you always go this way. If there is something in a process, what caused it must be more primary. Would you agree there's an idea in his mind? It's intelligible. Therefore, he must be intelligible, or within him is something intelligible. Therefore, he's good, has the intelligible has the intelligible reason because he constructed it now when you take a look at all of these great qualities that remember that we mentioned before that we decided to take together as a simultaneous whole remember when we did that pull all of those together now pull all those together remember shall we go over them first what was it desire, desire. desire. two desires Took over, brought, in, order, brought into order, see, judges, deems, judges. See, yeah. He's doing all of that to ensure that everything so far as possible will become like himself. For a likeness is the supreme originating principle. So look here, as much as it is possible. Now, is there a principle which stands higher to order 
Yes, we said there is one, intelligible. Something intelligible will naturally appreciate order. All right, do the same thing now. If there is some governing principle called like or likeness that's governing everything, then there must be a prior principle higher than that from which likeness emerges. Yeah, I'll give you a whole bunch of them. All right, here we go. Identity. Same. Similar. Equal. All right. Like. Similitude. We'll leave that out since it's a, it should be the same as the word like. All right? Therefore, since there is, since there is a demiurgos that has something intelligible within him, we're saying there must be a likeness between the two. This is what we're guiding. Therefore, if likeness is the principle, the principle behind likeness must be higher than likeness, and that must either be same or identity. Why? Remember a short while ago we talked about similar, and we said similar can only be used when you're talking about two orders of things which are essentially different, where there's an ordered pair. One ordered pair must be related to the other in such a way that you can make connections between the first of the third of the second and the fourth. Remember when we did that? All right. Therefore, if we say the word is similar, then that means there must be a different order between the demiorgos and the intelligible living creature. Therefore, there must be that much difference there. If we say sameness is governing, then we can say there must be something essentially the same between these two. If we say identity, then there is no demiorgos other than the intelligible living creature. Okay, if it's the same as, then there wouldn't be any process of creation because you need a model for creation. Therefore, it can't be the same. Oh, pardon me, it can't be identity. Excuse me, I, I jumped. But if we say that there must be something that's the same between these two, then can we say the same thing for the artist? Can we not say that the idea in his mind and himself are very much akin? For the artist couldn't be an artist if he had an appreciation of the models upon which he's going to construct his work. Therefore, there must be a central property between the intelligible and the demiurgos. Therefore, sameness is the essential quality we need. Not identity, not similar, not equal, there would be no difference. So therefore, we can say between these two things, there is the idea of same. There must be a fundamental sameness between the two. Now, what is this, what is that, look here, if this is an idea, if this is an idea or a model, now we move over to our, our painter. What is there about him being a painter, that it's essential for him to be a painter, a high craftsman, artist if you prefer, what is it about being an artist and having such a cultivated idea? Must there be an interconnection between the two? Let me do it again. If there is a great sculptor, would we call him a great sculptor because in his very capacity of being a great sculptor, he knows how to fashion an idea in his mind and upon that then to create his object? Then, and therefore, for a sculptor or a painter, there must be something akin that he has developed between the model and his own being as a painter or a sculptor. Well, then, if that's the case, then that same thing between the idea and the mind of God, obviously, is going to be the nature of the demiurgos must be mind. In mind, therefore, necessarily, there has to be lofty ideas, and that most lofty of all is called the forms in Plato, which then is used as the basis for all creation. Why now, do yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Why do we do similar? Uh, you said that. Okay, the similar. Model and the mind yeah, day. let's do it. Yeah.
Yeah. Because I, I can see no, no, where okay. identity does not apply yeah. and where no, no, equality so doesn't apply. Would you agree we said that in an analogy, these must be different, different orders. Like this is husbandry, as they call it. The care of animals. A shepherd is to his sheep. A ruler to his subjects. They must, they must be similar orders, but different, because you can't put the ruler and his subjects in the class of husbandry, because otherwise the ruler would treat his subjects like animals. Right? So therefore, an analogy presupposes at least two sets, minimum of course, two sets that must be different in some respect, but what did we say? The relations between the two of them must be similar, not the same, because remember the fun we had? If a ruler were to function in the same way that a shepherd does, then he would probably have a dog and uh, heard his people to voting every you know, right, right second Tuesday <laughs> in November, or bring his subjects up to a mountain to get some grass and that might upset somebody. Right, right. right, right. That's, that's how you can get humor out of analogies, by the way. All right, so what did we say? We said, therefore, that these belong in different orders where we can find similar, not same, functions. Right? And we said, if it were the same, then this ruler would be just like a shepherd, and that would make it uh, make it ludicrous, would it not? It would. Right, right. So therefore, it's not the same, but must be similar. Right, it must be similar. So, if we say then they're similar, the mind of God, and the idea in the mind of God, then they'd have to be in different orders, and must function differently. And we said, oh, wait a minute, that's pretty dope. Oh, Can we do that? And remember we said likeness occurs when you make contrast between different orders of things, however the relationships between them must be similar. I see, now that's how we arrive at the use of same yeah. as opposed to the other. Or put it this way, okay. let us assume you're, no, let, let us assume that the, these are similar rather than the same. Let's go for that for a moment. Then. The demiurgos must stand in a similar set. Say we can say this as the demiurgos is to his to uh, his idea, using the capital I to represent that. So too. Uh, Husbandry stands to politics. No. Is the difference between the demiurgos and an idea of the same order as husbandry is to politics? Or are they, they're, are they, are they so different we wouldn't want to do that because the relationship is much more akin? No, no. It looks like, would you agree, that these are not different orders it looks like they belong in the same set, don't they? The same set. Well, yeah, like a shepherd and his sheep belong in the same set as the Damiar goes to his ideas, as a ruler is to his subject. Well, they belong to the same set. Oh, same set. If so, then there must be something the same between the two of them. Now, uh oh, gotta watch. Watch, watch. All right. I want to get to the last idea, and then we can throw it open quick for questions. All right. On page, I want to bring it together with the last page, which I find quite exceptional. One eighty-seven.
now he reflects back on the whole thing, you see, this is now uh, 50 pages from where we were reading. And God gave unto man's foolishness the gift of divination. A sufficient token is this. No man achieves true and inspired divination when, his ration, when in his rational mind, but only when the power of his intelligence is fettered in sleep or when it's distraught by disease or by reason or some divine inspiration. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the divining and inspired nation, nature and all the visionary forms that were seen and by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant and for whom they portend evil or good in the future, the past, or the present. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or waking vision by the divining and inspired nation, nature and all the visionary forms that were seen and by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant and for whom they portend evil or good in the future, past, present. See, he's taking dreams and he's talking about it in the same way. Because dreams are nothing other than a creation. Dreams are a creation. They're our creation in a way. They come out of us. And it's his belief that when you're in a rational state of mind, you should be able to decide upon the nature of dreams in a rational way. You should be able to decide on whether or not it brings good or evil to someone, whether it opens up and they can therefore reflect upon what's vital in their present, past, and future. But it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or in waking vision and all the visionary forms that were seen by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant for whom they portend good or evil in the future. Hey, you know what? He's using the same process of exploring the, the creation and the ideas you need to talk about in this creation as he is doing in dreams. That's what he's giving us. So, let's try it this way. Would you not agree in dreams you're astonished by its apparent reality, though it appears absolutely real to you when you have a dream? What is the substance of it? What's the substance of it? What's the substance of the dream? mind. That's all you see is your mind in the dream. You're not there present in the action. So therefore you're creating it. It goes through all the changes and transformations. But you have to decide wherein lies the meaning. And you have to ponder it and figure it out. And therefore he brings together dreams, divination, theology, cosmology into a splendid whole. And I thought I would like to introduce you to him because the most interesting of all things is what's the substance of all creation? He calls it, and he only uses one word when he makes a simile with it, gold, formless, out of which all forms emerge. He never says anything about it. So, what is it? What is this? Mine. Could be. Be nice if it were. All we have to know is one question, which is one I enjoy very much. If everything is mine, how is it that we don't see it as mine? Right. That's an easy answer. <laughs> I have an easy answer for you. Go ahead. All right? <laughs> That's because everybody is convinced they know what mind is and they know this isn't. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.